Let's also welcome in Delegate Michael Hype back from road racing. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Great to be here. Well, we've got a lot of things to get to here uh, this morning, and some of it is business-related and some of it is pleasure. And I want to start with the pleasure part of it first because Mike did not join us last Friday, and this was an excused absence for a pretty good cause. It was. Self, I... Self-gratification. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, you have to have some self-gratification. What's the sense of working for it if you can't have some fun with it? That's exactly right. Right. So tell me about uh, road racing, a Ferrari, and a Lamborghini. So uh, last last Christmas, I gave to my three sons and my son-in-law a, a trip to uh, Extreme Experience, um, which is road racing, um, uh high-end exotic sports cars uh that was their christmas present so uh you get to pick a a sports car um that they have and you get to go down on the track and and race it around the track for you know three or four laps and um, not an oval a road track no it's a road track yeah Yeah. two mile road track um with a a long straightaway and um I, i picked uh the um lamborghini hurricane um my three sons picked the ferrari f88 and uh my son-in-law picked uh the porsche gt4 all right so of the uh, cars you drove the lamborghini and the ferrari i I did so i started off with the the hurricane and um drove around and uh when i got out of the car um and you go back to give me your helmet i was like no what's it going to cost me to drive the ferrari and and they were like, well, um, you know, it would probably we could take like thirty percent off or something. So it's going to be another, you know, I don't know, like three hundred dollars or something. It was or three thirty or something. I think is what it was. And uh, and I was like, no, that's too much. How about three hundred? And he was like, sold. Get back in line. And I was like, dang, going it. I should have gone lower. <laughs> like a, just like a kid in an amusement yeah. park getting um, back in line, huh? Yeah, exactly. So, and when I when he said three thirty, and I was like, "No, that's too much." Three hundred. He could have went to three fifty. I still would have paid it, um, <laughs> he, but he didn't know that. Sure. So, um, I had a blast. I got back in in line. I drove the uh, Ferrari F eighty eight, and uh, man, these cars are are fantastic. These are these are literally racing cars that are street legal. Um, they they are phenomenal cars. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend this. This was Where's phenomenal. the course located, Mike? Um, well, this this particular group goes all around the country. Um, so this particular weekend, the stop was uh, in Richmond at Dominion Speedway. Not quite to Richmond. It's it's sort of around King's Dominion area is yeah. where it is. So um, almost to Richmond. So we drove down there uh, for the day and, and drove – exotic sports cars so it's a traveling group as opposed to being fixed in one place it it is they go around the country uh to several different locations and do this how many cars do they have mike they had i'm gonna say 10 or 15 cars there that day um they had they had several ferraris and several lamborghinis um not quite as many porsches um several of the uh the hellcats um so and all these are stick shift, or automatic shift. All, all, all of them are automatic. They had, they used to do stick shift. Uh, they've been doing this for probably ten or fifteen years now. Um, they said they used to do stick shift or paddle shift, and you could do those. He said, uh, but there were so many people who didn't know what the heck they were doing. They were replacing transmissions, and you can imagine what a transmission yeah, costs in one of those. So they stopped. It's automatic only. You know, you mentioned this is extreme experience. That would also probably include things like the trapeze. Have you ever considered being on the trapeze? Um, no, <laughs> and have no desire to get on a trapeze. But I have I have loved driving fast yeah. since I you know since I could drive. I've loved your car insurance fast. agent uh, absolutely um, agrees. So and and so do the the police officers. Um, <laughs> they they can attest to that as well. Um, so I have trouble. I have a lead foot. So um, this was this was a great experience for me. Yeah. So uh, there's other cars on the track at the same time you're out there, though, right? Um, they they were, um, and you know some of those individuals need to have their their man card removed. Oh, um, <laughs> but hey, talk about the rules for uh, driving these cars because you just don't pop the 
the, they'll throttle down and just go as fast as you want, no repercussions. There, there are some rules you have no, to follow. No, no, no. When so when you first get there, you have to go through a class. It's about 30, 45 minutes long, and they and they tell you all the rules and and there's cones out there, and they tell you what all the cones mean. And and, and there's going to be a professional driver in the passenger seat with you, and he's going to give you instruction as you're driving. And they'll tell you, listen, there's no governors on these vehicles. These are the way they're designed to go. You can go as fast as you want on this course. However. And they go down a list, and they said, if if two wheels go off of the hard surface, it is five hundred dollars. If four wheels go off of the hard surface, it is fifteen hundred dollars. If any part of a the body of the of your car touches anything else, it's like twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> and they give you this list of numbers, so they're like, drive it as much as you want, as hard as you want. However, <laughs> there are consequences. There are consequences. You, you, all fair, you mentioned a little old lady driving. Tell that yeah, story. So, uh, yeah, so they, they told us there was a little old lady that was, was driving um, a few years ago, about 80 years old, and um, they got in. They said, you can go as fast as you want, as slow as you want. And she was doing 35, 40 mile an hour around the track, and, and the, the professional driver is sitting there says, you know, ma'am, you could speed up. You can go as fast as you want. She goes, I just paid $400 to drive her Lamborghini. I'm going to stay in this thing as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs> See, with age comes wisdom, yeah, It does, Bill. it does, yes. <laughs> wisdom, baby. Yeah. So uh, I imagine you have to buy an insurance policy on these vehicles, too, to drive. No, no, it's all part of the, the, the payment that you make when you, you sign up to do this. Uh, so it's you, all you crash a $200,000 vehicle? Your, the payment covers the cost of that? Yep. Minus the $2,500. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's a good price for a Lamborghini. I'd yeah. take that in a second, right? Yeah. I'm surprised. I would think that they would want to lay that off on somebody. Yep. Is, is there a tendency, Mike, to try to race the guy, the other folks on the track? Um, I think there's an, a tendency for people like myself to, um, to pass as many people as yeah, possible yeah. you know it was it was sort of get the heck out of the way and and then um you know if i can see somebody a half a mile ahead of them my my tendency is i'm going to catch them and i did on several occasions um way too quick which is why i was like yeah, you know some people yeah. need to probably not do this it's probably too much for them and I, i'll be quite honest so when we first got there we did a, a drive along with a um a professional driver and a hellcat and um they go around the track, so you get to see where all the turns and everything yeah. are. And they drive like a professional, so he, he drove the heck out of this car. Uh, 750 horsepower, and, and he drove it. But no banks on the track. No banks on the track at all. Um, there's a quarter to a half mile straight away, and you know, 750 horsepower down that straightaway is pretty fast. Um, but it's the only time in my life where I've actually gotten a little car sick. I got queasy yeah. after getting out of this charge, and I think it was because I didn't have control. We were going really fast, yeah. and I didn't have control, but I saw what some of these cars can do, and I was like, all right, you know. So when I first got into the car by myself and I was going to drive, I was a little tentative, uh, probably the most tentative I've ever been in a car. Um, but once I started getting the feel of it and stuff like that, I think that sort of went away pretty quick. And then and the neat thing about these cars is, um, you know, when, when you go to, to turn the wheels on a regular car, you can do like two and a half turns of your sure. steering wheel. <laughs> this is a, a quarter turn turns the wheels all the way. So yep. you don't have to turn very much to get the, the wheels to turn in this thing. And you can put, you know, 10 and 2 and, and this and this and that. I mean, you know, that's, that's all you have to turn these wheels. You mentioned you gave this gift to your family for Christmas. I did. Mm -hmm. You know, Rob and I accept Christmas gifts as well. We do. I, I, indeed. And yeah. we don't have to limit it just to Christmas. That could right. be any it could holiday. Be birthday any, gifts. It could be the 4th of July. Any holiday, any religion yeah. follows. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll consider. I'll, remember that, Mike. I'll consider that. We're not proud. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't like the way you said consider. Which one did you like better, Lamborghini or Ferrari? Um, I'm, I'm going to say the Ferrari. Now, in... In fairness to the Lamborghini, the Ferrari is the last thing I drove. And by that time, I had already been around the track six times, six laps. Um, so when I got into the Ferrari, there, the, the whole tentativeness was out the window. It was mash the foot pedal and go as fast as you can. As a matter of fact, when we got into the Ferrari, um, 
I, I told the professional driver beside me, I said, you know, the last time I was, I said, I passed a lot of people the last time. I said, is there any way we can get to the lead to the back so I don't have to worry about passing anybody? He says, no. He says, we're the last car in line. He says, there's no way to get to the lead of the pack. He says, what we'll do, though, is when, when they take off, when the lead car goes out, he says, we'll sort of drift and we won't go very fast, you know, and we'll let them get a, a good bit ahead of us. And that way we don't have to worry about lap traffic. And I was like, all right, that sounds like a good idea. We get out there. We, we're sort of drift at five mile an hour um and let them get a good ways ahead of us and um and then he says all right we can and before he got go out of his mouth i'd already mashed the pedal and we were just flying around the track um and then i wasn't even halfway around the track i'd already caught my first you know car and i was and and by that time it was that 80 year old lady from two years before it may have been still driving (laughs) um but I think he realized, because there's enough turns, I think he realized, all right, this guy sort of knows what he's doing. He can drive fast. He can take the turns. Um, and he's going around the track the right way. There's there's ways you go into turns and things like that um, that he sort of figured. So they just get on the radio. When you're coming up on a car at a certain point, they get on the radio and say, all right, move over. This guy's going to pass you. So by the time I completed the first lap in the, in the Ferrari, um, he was already calling ahead and telling people to move over. Could those vehicles survive the right lane of I-81? The right lane? Um, well, Can yeah, anything they... <laughs> survive the right lane of I-81? As slow as it goes. Um, I, don't, I don't know, man. That's um, That would be hard on those vehicles. Yeah. Hey, really what, what do uh, people who uh, think they know how to drive fast not know that you know now about high speed driving going into turns and such um people that think they know how to drive fast well everybody thinks they know how to drive period but they um they really don't it and i think it's the angle of attack into these these you know that you have to go wide and dive into these um these turns and what you don't know about these supercars is the fact that they can take these turns at high speeds um, the, the, the traction control on these vehicles is phenomenal that, that hairpin turns that, you know, we'd normally be doing five, 10 mile an hour around these things can take at 50 and 60 miles an hour. And, and the professional driver is telling you, get in the gas, get into the gas. You can take it faster. You know, I'm, I'm feeling it's pushing me out the, the side door. Getting some G force. Uh, yes. Cause of the G forces. And he's telling me to accelerate faster. And I'm like, Oh my, you know, I can only imagine how they drive these cars. You know, I think I'm driving fast. The professional drivers in these, uh, they... Different story, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, after <laughs> spending time in a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, do you have a better appreciation of my people and my culture? Um, <laughs> the Italians know how to build cars. I, that's all I'm going to say. And I, <clears throat> But, you know, so do the Americans because that Hellcat was a phenomenal car as well. That hey, thing was just brute force. You, that was, you said 750 horsepower in that thing, roughly. So if you remember, you're, you're not that much different in age than I am. So you remember coming up in the, the 60s muscle cars. You're, you're too young for that, as was I. But the 70s and whatever, those things were still left over. And you still see them on the street now and then. Mm-hmm. Those things, when you're talking about those four-barrel, 400-cubic-inch engines were idling at like 30, 40 miles an hour, mm-hmm. were was that this, a similar story for the Lamborghini and the Ferrari? If you put the car in drive and just took your foot off the pedal, was it going to do some creep forward? No, no. These things, these things are are such uh, modern marvels um, that that they don't do anything that you. The, the, it's all about input. They, you know, if if you don't want it to go, it doesn't go. If you want it to go, it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to go faster on a curve, it goes faster on a curve. It, nothing like those '60s and '70s muscles cars, which were straight line vehicles. Um, and and I used to have a, a '70 vet that was 454. Um, and, which was a riot in that little yeah, car. Uh, and straight line, these things were, but going around a curve, these things sort of like float the front ends. Yeah. You, know, you don't want any parts of those things um, going around a, a track like this. Um, so I love the old muscle cars as well. I love that, that high horsepower. But even the, the Hellcat um, wasn't as good around the, the turns. Straight line, get out of its way. Because it, going down the straightaway, I think it probably um, out accelerates and goes faster than the Italian cars. But going around the curves, it, 
it's nothing like the Italian cars. Yeah, you know, it's, if you think about American and European culture, that pretty much mimics what the what the culture is. <laughs> um, yeah, the Europeans are a little bit more refined with negotiation. Americans are just <laughs> burst right through. Yeah, the, the Italians train. are more like Barish Nikolf, and the Americans are more like Travis Bajan. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, let's switch gears and go to the legislative breakfast yesterday through uh, Rotary. Did uh-huh. most of the uh, Eastern I'm Panhandle right Chamber Chamber? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Did most of the Eastern Panhandle delegation attend? Uh, yes, most of them did. Yes. All right. What kind of things were discussed? What'd you get out of that? Um, actually, pretty substantive uh, discussion. Uh, not a whole lot about um, social issues. Most of it was about um, you know some of the the tax reform that we did this this past legislation. Um, some of the, the the bigger issues that are still going on, like corrections and, and what's going on there. Um, so I think it was a pretty informative discussion. Um, and you know, uh, Senator Blair got animated a couple of times, I'm which every, everybody likes. Um, and um, orange he, specs, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> um, and uh, he he had a good had a good uh, breakfast. So uh, I think everything went well. Mar- uh, Maria Lawrence. was the uh, moderator. Maria was the the moderator. Lawrence. did a, did a great job as always. So um, um, fantastic. Fantastic. I understand she gave uh, shout outs to WRNR that she had. Uh, well, she did. Um, there were a couple of times when, um, you know, when people were asking questions and, and she may have mentioned, you know, you know, uh, we, we spoke about this on WRNR the other day, um, being a, a uh, co-host here that, you know, she gets a little shout out there. So, yeah, WRNR got some some uh, talk time. We love the pub. So uh, there was an article the other day about the vacancy rates in the prisons, Mike, correctional facilities, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, in regards to number of correctional officers that they are down in here in the Eastern Panhandle, the two Martinsburg facilities, the uh, Vicki Douglas Juvenile Detention Center and the ERJ, both had 54% vacancy rates amongst uh, corrections officers. Not the worst in the state, but I think second, tied for second or third uh, in the state. I'm sure that was probably part of your conversation yesterday, and you just finished interim sessions. Is there any progress being made on a solution for that? Um, I, I think there is. Um, if I, I believe if if we were come to the table tomorrow and vote on it in the House, and if it was just about pay raises, I think you'd probably get an overwhelming majority of the House members that would say, yes, let's just, you know, give these individuals a raise let's let's try to fix this um i think the senate has taken a a more cautioned approach and to their to their credit i think they are that they're saying listen we just can't throw money at this situation we have to fix it and fix it right this time so that we're not coming back two or four years later and and having the same problem so i can appreciate their approach um, because they want to fix the whole thing and their attitude is this is not just about money let's figure out whether uh, what are the root causes and fix it all so uh, you know i applaud them for taking that but at the same time my attitude is let's get it done let's get everybody in a room let's figure it out let's get it done where in the meantime we're wasting too much time um but I, I think those talks, I know those, some of those talks did happen during interims. I know some of those talks did happen. There were some meetings even after interims um, with all the major players. So I, I think it's happening. Mike, I, what are mm-hmm. some of the variables that can be fixed? Uh, other than money. Other than money, yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a great question. Some of it uh, could be um, the retirement and the retirement age and how that's all set up. <clears throat> it could be the expectations of uh, and qualifications uh, of the guards. Um, I think there's a lot of different, and you sort of have to go to them and say, you know, what what are the reasons, you know, that you guys are leaving? What are the reasons that you don't want to do this? Um, well, burnout's part of it, but you can take absolutely. care. Absolutely. But if you get, if you get fully staffed, you'll take care of the burnout aspect. That that helps a lot of the burnout uh, attitude, um, but. You can't, you can't expect these individuals who are putting, you know, it's just like law enforcement. They're putting their lives on the line. They're doing a very difficult job, um, and they're getting paid about what somebody or less than somebody that can go to sheets and go to work. So you, 
you've got to give them the the benefits and the pay that's um, equal to what they're doing. Yeah, the disconnect for a lot of us, Mike, and I can appreciate the Senate trying to go to root cause, whatever that means. That's kind of a throwaway Mm -hmm. statement. Uh, But with a surplus that has been advertised, has been literally thrown out in front of us on a weekly basis, how great the surplus is and growing all the time, the disconnect is why don't we fix some of these problems? Um, and I think from a house perspective, that's pretty much our attitude that the, the, the attitude has gotten to the point where you can't do any base building. Um, you know, you can't grow the budget, those types of things. Um, I think the attitude in the house has gotten to the point where like, we have to stop this. Okay. There has to be some base building at some point. You can't do a flatline budget forever. Yeah. Um, and we've done a lot of the different things that we set out to do with tax reform and those types of things. It is now time to go back and fix these issues that we've sort of kicked down the road. Um, and, and corrections being one of them. Um, especially when you're still seeing these enormous surpluses. If these enormous surpluses are still there, then we need to go back and maybe do some base building in in certain areas. And I'm I'm not a get or, or, I'm not for growing the budget and and expanding on every little thing, but there are some issues like like corrections where I think we need to. A budget over time has to grow though because life costs more as it goes along. So That's healthcare correct. benefits cost more. People need to make more in order to pay for the increased cost of life. And we've had a couple of good years of inflation in a row that has really taught us all that lesson pretty uh, quickly here. Uh, and, and there are things that you have to replace and buy and whatever. And those things cost more over time, too. So some budget creep is going to be a natural part of the process. Uh, are there things that can be cut to offset that? Uh, you would know that better than the rest of us. Uh, the other aspect of this is the, the surpluses don't include salaries saved by not having people in those positions, as I understand it, too. That's correct. Because that's money that's already gone out to these departments. And if you have uh, 300 or 3,000, whatever the number is, of correctional officers that aren't being employed in the state because we can't find them, that's that many salaries that haven't been uh, paid and benefits that haven't been paid and taxes that haven't been paid by these departments because they don't have people. What happens to that money at the end of the year, Mike? Yeah, I don't know what that number is, but it stays in their budgets, in that, that department's budgets. So you may see, some, see something in, in corrections, then they'll say, well, we're a lot of that money is getting eaten up um, through overtime because mm-hmm. we're having to pay so much overtime that we normally wouldn't pay. And that would be some of their excuses. But that's not the case in all of these different um, departments. Uh, and you're right, with with a, a 50% vacancy rate, if, if you're paying $10 million a year in, in uh, salaries, then you would think at 50% vacancy rate, there must be $5 million sitting at the side at the end of the, the year. That's not entirely true because of the, the, the overtime that's being paid, but there certainly should be something left. Um, and in some of these areas um, where they haven't filled uh, positions um, and they're not doing the overtime, they just haven't filled positions, um, there should be money left over uh, there as well. So uh, the legislature has to go back every so often uh in finance and and start questioning line items on the budget and saying uh you didn't spend all this money here it's still sitting over in your cash um uh deposits and and you know what is your plan to do that because sometimes that money gets higher than they're authorized to spend they have a a spending limit so if it's higher than they're authorized to spend then why is it still sitting in your account and sometimes we need to sweep that money back and say that needs to go back into general fund until you can fill these positions you know we're not going to continue to give you the money if you don't fill the positions And, and it's not their necessarily their fault that they're not filling the positions if they can't get people and everybody has trouble filling positions mm-hmm. right now the government the private sector everybody has trouble so it's not necessarily their fault that they're not filling the positions they're actively trying to it's just not happening but the fault resides in part the ceiling which they can pay some of that absolutely um you know they're they're is a a limit to what they can pay and sometimes that's not as much as the private sector pays so they're competing with the private sector for those people 
And also they're competing with other parts of the government as well. Uh, we'll use corrections for an example. They're notoriously low in, uh, in the salaries. And people realize this. People know not only is that on the absolute sense, but the relative sense. Of the Rob, can I do a quick shout-out before we leave? I couldn't stop you if I, I know, wanted to. I know. <laughs> Scott Woodmire, who's a local uh, native of, uh, of Martinsburg, father's uh, son of Doug Woodmire. Scott is receiving an honorary doctorate this morning at WVU commencement, commencement exercise. So Very nice. Real tribute to Scott. He's done a lot for the community, a lot for the nation. He mm-hmm. was uh, He's made quite a mark for himself in inside the D.C. area. And I believe the uh, Doug Woodmire Habitat for Humanity golf tournament is coming up next week too. exactly right and of course doug was also very active with the rescue mission and scott has picked up a lot of these uh uh uh, same sort of functions. He's, he doesn't live here anymore. He lives in New York, uh, but his the, his impact is fairly is very far reaching. 